Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good night, wherever it is you are. Um, to the, welcome to the Global Education Conference. My name is Kim Wilkins, and you're in the Tech Girls Challenge workshop. I've started the recording. Um, so first, we want to thank the sponsors. Um, this is just an incredible opportunity to be able to share what we're doing uh, with educators and students from around the world um, through the Global Education Conference, and that just wouldn't be possible without um, all our partners. So we want to thank them very much. So uh, this is the Tech Girls Challenge. Um, I am in Charlottesville, Virginia at 5 a.m. in the morning, so I might be a little off. <laughs> I'm just waking up myself. But again, I'm really happy for this opportunity uh, to talk about something uh, that I'm passionate about, that I started um, just this past October, and I'm hoping that we can see it spread um, outward. Uh, so my name is Kim Wilkins. I'm the founder of Tech Girls, and I also uh, teach computer science to kindergarten through eighth grade um, here. So I'm very passionate about technology and computer science. And the reason I founded Tech Girls, the where did I start and what do I do, um, I went to a conference uh, called Grace Hopper Celebration in 2010. I have been in technology my whole career, whether teaching or doing it. Um, but it wasn't until I went to this conference that I heard that the number of women studying computer science had actually gone down um, instead of going up. And I studied computer science in the late 80s, and we were about 27%. Um, so you know, definitely not 50-50, um, but not as bad as it is now, which I just did not realize until this conference, and it really affected me. So at the conference, I learned that women studying computer science made up 18% of uh, computer science graduates, that um, high-level jobs you know, was even worse ratio, and that women were likely to quit technology at a, race, a rate twice that of men. Um, so these are all directions that should not be happening. We should have been going the other way. And the reason I'm super passionate about it is because technology is really impacting sort of everything we do in the world now. And so if half the population is not part of the decisions and making that technology, um, you know, then we're missing voices. We're missing um, different ways to think about how we can solve problems. So found that out in 2010. Um, I was teaching at the time. And in 2012, uh, after talking to a lot of people, doing a lot of research, I decided I wanted to do something in my community at a grassroots level. And so I started Tech Girls. And after that, I had volunteers coming to help run activities, um, a lot of women in the community. And they also um, felt a need to get together and learn from each other and be a support system, because they were often the only female um, in their office um, or wherever they were working. So we started uh, an official nonprofit called Charlottesville Women in Tech, and then that became the umbrella organization for Tech Girls. And um, I'm talking about MozFest. When I first went to MozFest, that's Mozilla's uh, celebration of the internet, because that's where I learned a lot about grassroots outreach and a lot about um, the internet health movement and how we can move forward on that. Uh, so I've had a relationship with them for quite a while. So what I do here in Charlottesville are three main programs. Uh, Girls Geek Day is uh, for elementary school, which is kindergarten through fifth grade here. Um, it is really an opportunity to spark uh, young girls' interest in technology and to keep them interested by building up this community of girls that they get to hang out with once a month and do really awesome activities. So it's uh, done monthly. It's hosted at local elementary schools throughout the region, and it's staffed by volunteers from the community who are also passionate about sharing their knowledge about um, STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and that's been a really successful project that started in 2014 and started with one um, day for the year, and now we're up to hosting nine to 10 um, Saturdays throughout the year. And we usually get 60 to 75 girls. Uh, middle school has actually been the toughest age group for me. That for us is sixth through eighth grade. 
because they're so busy, they have sports after. And this is actually where I see interest decline. And it's not because they didn't come in with interest from elementary school, but it's because now stereotypes are coming in and they're uh, being actively discouraged from doing computer science and technology things, which is quite a bummer. Um, so I've tried a lot of different things, but yes, we, yes, we tech is the latest that seems to be going really well. Um, I get local tech companies and organizations to host monthly meetups in their spaces. And so the girls get to go behind the scenes and see what's going on. And we have female mentor, role models and mentors um, talk to the girls about what it is like to have a career in technology. And the final program is the Biomed Tech Girls program. Um, that is a collaboration with the University of Virginia, uh, the chair local, their biomedical engineering department, and Tech Girls. And it's a week-long summer program where we go really in-depth into both biomed tech and um, computer science, and the girls create projects that solve real-world problems throughout the week. So it's a plus they get behind the scenes lab tours and things like that. So it's really um, a great program. So those are the things that I've been doing grassroots here in Charlottesville. Um, and I told you about some of the statistics uh, for the United States. I went and looked up some statistics for ICT uh, in other areas. This is. Um, uh, European stats, and you can see the average is uh, in 2016 was 17% um, of women stu students studying computer science, um, ICT field, so, you know, not a great story there as well. Um, these are some facts from UNESCO uh, that women, you know, make up a majority of people who are illiterate. And um, this includes digital literacy. Uh, digital literacy now is, you know, on par as with all the other kind of literacies we have. Of the 7 million people working in ICT, 30% um, are women. And then again, those high-level jobs, the CEOs and us stuff are really not much representation at all by women. And we have uh, lots of different issues about that. There's definitely um, an intergenerational divide. Um, I see it in my students and um, teachers and parents. Uh, you know, the students are very much more comfortable being around technology. Not that they know how to create it, but they definitely know how to use it. And there's often a discomfort with that level um, with the adults. Uh, we do have a leaky pipeline, which means that even those that are interested um, in the beginning often get pushed out, whether it's stereotypes that are doing it, whether it's a hostile work environment, um, things like that. So we've got a, definitely a lot of work to do all along um, the pipeline. And of course, uh, the, the education needs to start much earlier. So like I said, I, started, I start teaching computer science uh, to kindergartners. And this is my sixth year of um, doing at this particular school that I'm at. And we're seeing just a, an enormous difference in not just females, but other students who might not traditionally consider computer science um, as something that they do, uh, that they are sticking with it through middle school and then into high school. Um, so we know that if we can start earlier, uh, there's going to be much more interest. And just to be clear, I'm not trying to make everybody a computer scientist, but I do feel that everybody, like it is a literacy now that everybody needs to understand some fundamental concepts to understand how technology works so that they can make it work for them um, as opposed to um, having it do stuff to them, which gets us, us to the Internet Health Report. So Mozilla has, um, I think this is the third year that they've released an Internet Health Report. And um, there's some very interesting things in it. Uh, of course, there's a lot of um, great things with technology and, and the Internet. We wouldn't be able to do conferences like this. Um, I am a big uh, Twitter user and have made a lot of connections with educators around the world um, using technology platforms. Um, it's, you know, the, the potential to create and innovate is amazing. But there are things that we have to consider that everybody needs to be aware of. So some of the items that they highlighted in the last report was that internet censorship is flourishing, 
uh, that governments worldwide continue to restrict Internet access in a multitude of ways, ranging from outright censorship to requiring people to pay additional taxes to use social media. Um, in 2018, there were 188 documented Internet shutdowns around the world, and a new form of repression is emerging, Internet slowdowns. So that's one area that there's a problem. Uh, biometrics are being abused. So when large swaths of the population don't have access to physical IDs, digital ID systems have the potential to make a positive difference. But in practice, digital ID schemes often benefit heavy-handed governments and private actors, not individuals. Um, so for instance, in India, over 1 billion citizens were put at risk by a vulnerability in the government's biometric ID system. And then finally, um, AI, artificial intelligence, is amplifying injustice. Uh, tech giants in the U.S. and China are training and deploying AI at a breakneck pace that doesn't account for potential harms. As a result, technology used in law enforcement, banking, job recruitment, and advertising often discriminates against women and people of color due to flawed data, false assumptions, and lack of tech technical audits. So again, while there's good stuff, there's also um, bad stuff that we have to consider with technology. So um, this past Moz Fest in October, uh, we launched the Tech Girls Challenge. So this is a way to, to take a look at some of these internet health issues and um, get girls and really anybody um, hands on with ways that they can think about it um, that makes sense to them. Because, uh, you know, the problems I described to you, they're big problems. They're also very um, abstract. Um, so we wanted to provide some activities that will really um, get the kids thinking more about what it means to their own lives. So I'm going to talk about uh, two of the challenges that we ran at MozFest and that I've since run um, with different uh, organizations um, here in Charlottesville. One is related to robotics, AI, and ethics. So, you know, with advances in AI, it is more important than ever that we consider how humans and robots interact. So how do you want the robots of the future to behave towards you and others? We uh, crafted a robot zine template where kids can share their ideas. And the main idea we want to get across to them is this idea of a code of conduct. Um, code of conducts are what many conferences and organizations use to describe how people will interact with each other in um, a kind way, and if they don't, what are the consequences? Um, this, you know, could also be thought of as ethics. And so these are things that um, kids especially often don't think about, um, and so this is an opportunity to kind of bring it um, home for them. So I'm just going to show you some um, samples. This is the template. So uh, the reason we did a zine, um, again, this is, again, something I learned at MozFest, uh, creating these little zines. So basically this template, you fill it out, and then there's a way you fold it and do a cutting that actually turns into a little booklet. And I was just at a bookstore <laughs> recently this weekend that uh, was selling, you know, unique and different books, and they actually had uh, some of these uh, homemade zines there um, that other had, people had made about a variety of topics. So uh, zines are really just a way um, for people who don't have access to, you know, publication systems to share their opinions and ideas um, in a very low-cost, fun way. And so we kind of took that on as an opportunity to have kids share so um, on the website that I'll share with you later, I have directions on how you do this special folding and cutting, but it's kind of like origami, so that's very fun too. Um, so the front is obviously uh, looks like this, and so this is what it looks like when it's folded up into a little booklet. So the first thing they do is either draw um, a robot that they envision or they can write about uh, what their robot is going to do. So thinking about um, if they could make their own robot, what would they like it to do? Again, helping them think of designers and inventors, that this is something that they could actually uh, create and do something with. And then what special powers does your robot have? You know, what, why, why does this robot exist? What is it going to be doing? Um, there were a lot of homework helper robots and clean up room robots. Um, that came through, so that was kind of fun. 
And then finally, um, what is the code of conduct? So here we have to do a little bit of explanation again, um, depending on the age group, about what a code of conduct means and um, why it's important. Uh, there are definitely examples of robots the kids invented that were going to protect them from the bad people uh, and keep them safe. And the special powers is that they would, you know, zap them or do something to the bad people. But then we have to talk about how do you determine how 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 is your code of conduct to determine whether somebody is bad or good? Um, really thinking more deeply about that because, um, again, it's just such an abstract concept in the larger picture, um, and so actually having to think about it, that is not an easy thing, uh, obviously, to uh, figure out when you're trying to code it and make it into reality. Um, so that's the robot scene. The other uh, area of Internet health that we looked at was privacy and security. So um, every day our privacy is at risk with data being collected about us as we share and live more of our lives online. For this activity, you'll explore how you do and do not protect your privacy online and then create a security avatar to help battle for your privacy. Again, this is such a super important concept for kids to start thinking about pretty early on because they're getting onto sites that start collecting their information earlier and earlier. Um, and so we want them to understand what it is uh, that they're giving away when they do things like that. So we created a set of five cards, um, sort of trading cards, and gave them uh, different abilities. So I'm just going to share the five cards with you. Here's the password genius. Um, and what I did is I looked up, you know, things that they could do that were age appropriate for them um, as uh, their powers that they were going to work on. And I've had a lot of parents um, look through these cards and really uh, are excited about them, about using them with their kids and, you know, making sure that they understand these things before um, they get onto the Internet and do things. So that's the password genius. Uh, we have the privacy doctor. I frequently check up on our privacy settings on social media sites and other places when I share information. Um, this is one I used to, uh, when I first first began teaching technology, um, I would talk about going into settings and um, making sure they were set up for privacy, and then that was it. Um, and now, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all these media, social media platforms are changing their privacy settings, it seems like, every other month. Um, and so it's not just good enough to do a one-time setup. It's got to be something that's part of your routine, um, which is what this is trying to help. Uh, sharing hero. I only post about others as I would like to have them post about me. Um, there's so much more that's behind this, but that seemed like the biggest, uh, you know, golden rule type uh, thing that could cover a lot of what we do about sharing. Uh, clickbait expert. I avoid links and emails, tweets, posts, and online advertising because I recognize that they could be spreading fake news or malware. Um, again, Understanding fake news and malware and how it gets disseminated is um, super important. Um, another activity that I do with kids before they get on social media is a foiling fake news um, lesson plan uh, because it's just such a um, problem uh, now to be able to determine what is fake, what is not, why is it happening. Um, kids especially, you know, they just tend to trust uh, things that they read, and so we need them to we need to help them understand you know why why does this stuff even exist? What is it that they're trying to do um, with these news articles? Um, the data guardian. Uh, when I use a product or service online, I figure out what data is being collected about me, uh, who is collecting it, and how it is used. I think this is the toughest of the cards to actually uh, do in practice. Uh, but it's just something to start getting getting them thinking about. Yeah, your data is being collected everywhere, so um, how can you deal with that? So those are um, just two examples. Uh, there are materials uh, that I'll show with you in a bit that 
will take you through an explanation that you can uh, give when you're doing the activity, um, all the printouts that you'll need for the activity, and um, where you can share about how it went. Uh, but if you're interested in this, it probably means you're interested in doing um, grassroots out, outreach, grassroots outreach. And so I just wanted to share some places you can start. Um, one of the things I've learned is you do need to start small, um, experiment and try stuff out. So when I started Tech Girls, um, I started with, I think, six girls in middle school. And um, I really had to work with the girls and get their feedback and, and ideas. And they were so helpful. And then they became mentors for the elementary school program that we started. And everything that um, you know we've done with Tech Girls is kind of, well, now we want to try this new thing, like the Yes We Tech or the Tech Girls Challenge. And how can we um, try it out with uh, the kids, get their feedback, um, get parent feedback, roll that back in, um, and and keep growing. So again, starting small. You don't have to. I was worried at first. I was like, okay, six girls. I just you know dedicated a big part of my life to. Um, this organization and starting so small was challenging, but um, now we reach hundreds of girls, so it's definitely um, something you have to have uh, patience for. Um, share your story and why does it matter that you're doing what you do. Um, that's how you get more people involved. That's how I um, got volunteers involved and the women who eventually started uh, Charlottesville Women in Tech. Um, it's how I get connected with other educators online when I share um, the things that I'm doing. And it's how I get to go to amazing conferences like MOSFEST in London uh, because I just keep sharing. I think sharing and being open about everything and transparent is um, hugely beneficial. It's also, you know, uh, taking a risk, um, stepping outside your comfort zone, um, things like that. So. But it, it definitely pays off. Uh, create a mission statement and stay true to it. Um, I have definitely veered off the path of my mission statement um, just because I'm interested in so many things <laughs> related to computer science and technology. Um, and I just have to, you know, if I'm feeling, especially if I'm feeling like I have taken on too much, um, if I'm stressed out, I'll go back and look at, okay, are these all these activities that I'm doing really um, aligned with the mission of Tech Girls and then um, cut some things out. Uh, often you'll need space and, and or maybe equipment um, to run these activities. The ones I showed you are unplugged, so you don't need technology for those. But of course, um, you know, there's a lot of things that you do need technology for. One of the other activities in the Tech Girls Challenge um, does require technology. And what I did is I found um, schools, I found actually a person in a school who was willing to open the doors um, to host activities. So really you need to find those people. Um, I found them in schools. I found them in tech businesses. I found them at the local university. So, um, but really making those connections with people who uh, can open the doors and be your host, if you will, um, at the site where you are has been really successful for me. And then, you know, find partners and cheerleaders. Um, I, there are a lot of tech-related uh, biz events in this community, and so I go to those to recruit volunteers. Um, I go to school events, um, you know, that aren't related to my school, that look like they're in the space. Um, I try to look um, ahead and behind in the pipeline to see uh, where um, there might be people who are interested in helping out. Um, through the Girls Geek Day, we have grown a lot of girls now who are activity leaders and volunteers and role models um, for this next crop of girls coming through the program. So, um, you know, use your programs to help groom those role models and activity leaders for the future. So the Tech Girls Challenge is available on the Tech Girls um, website. It's at tech-girls.org slash challenge. Um, you can see the two challenges. And then that third challenge is the digital inclusion and openness. That's a uh, art, digital art challenge um, that 
can result in a, a gallery. Uh, we do have a gallery that we started at MozFest. Um, unfortunately, our technology wasn't working at MozFest, so the gallery is actually images of the uh, robot zines and uh, avatars that were created, and we'd love to share those out too. So if you have images of um, those that you'd like to share in uh, the gallery, you are welcome to that. The gallery is open. It's a Padlet, um, and there's a link to it in the resources. So all the resources uh, that you need to run these activities are uh, linked right there. So with that, yep. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity again to share about the Tech Girls Challenge. I would love to help anybody who is interested in trying it out. Um, if the information on the website is not enough, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. There's a contact uh, page on the website that will get an email to me. And um, enjoy the rest of the Global Education Conference. Thanks. Bye.